recording awesome. started. And Ted, turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Sherman. Super happy to be here with you guys. Uh, uh, this is a, as I said, I've got to be with the Scrum and Wine group a couple times, and that's been a, a lot of fun. And uh, hoping this year I get to hang out with you guys even more. And I'm really uh, happy to share some of this uh, work, things that I'm passionate about with you guys, which is uh, habit change. And I'll start up my presentation. So let me share my screen and make sure we get this all working. So let's see, you guys should be seeing my screen and then I'll click on this. Are you seeing my uh, total brain coaching? Total brain. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. That's great. Good, so I'd like to start with a quote. The most important factor in survival is neither intelligence nor strength, but adaptability. And this is uh, quoted from Leon Megason, who's, which is building off uh, Charles Darwin. Um, it this quote has been attributed to Darwin, but it's found out that Megason really took this quote from all the work that he did with Darwin. But it, a lot of experts agree, this is definitely uh, Darwin's thoughts. So just today, um, love to get some introductions. Uh, you can just type it in the, the chat, a name, place, and one unusual habit, if you're up for sharing that, or just a habit, uh, just to kind of go with the theme of the talk. And I'll share, uh, a habit I have in the morning, it's called the Maui habit that I've been working on for the last year. Every When I wake up in the morning and my feet touch the ground, I, I kind of turn to the right and, and if the sun's, usually the sun's coming up and uh, I just uh, am thinking to myself, this is gonna be an amazing day and I'm really grateful that I get to do it. Um, and that's that's a, a unusual habit that I've been doing for a while, but it's definitely, uh, I felt added a lot of value to my life. So today we're gonna to talk about total brain coaching. Why did, why did we create it? When I say we, um, I'll tell you a story about, I was been scrum mastering for quite some time and then senior scrum mastering and then agile coaching and trying to do transformations around agility, uh, DevOps type and AWS cloud. And I found things, that I thought should be easier or really hard. It was really hard to get people to change their behaviors, to change their mindset, to change their culture. Um, and that was my job really. So uh, luckily I also had, not only from my computer background, but I had a neuroscience background. And my father, uh, Dr. Robert Keith Wallace has done a lot of top research on meditation, um, and a lot of neuroscience work. So I got my head together with him and I said, dad, you know, this stuff's really hard. How do we kind of help people change these habits faster? So we got, this was about two years ago, we started going very deeply into this. And from that came uh, two books. One was the Coherence Code uh, and then the other is Total Brain Coaching. And the reason why we did two is because I really liked the Phoenix Project. And I wanted to write one that had uh, kind of a, one of these business fables that has the total brain coaching framework built into it. So um, the coherence code is kind of a fun story with, you know, a little bit unreal, a little bit real, but um, it uses the total brain coaching. The main character helps the people using these seven principles that we'll talk about. And then this is more of the coaching book that has the principles. Um, so we'll also talk a little bit about what are habits and how do we change them and what are these seven principles of total brain coaching. So the way I view habits is as neural circuits um, for the large part. Uh, so if I want to create a habit of drinking water every morning, I will, you know, first morning I'll wake up and I'll think about, oh yeah, maybe I'll remember that I wanted to start this habit. And uh, after a little bit, if I'm, if I'm good on that habit, I'll probably start putting a glass of water next to my dresser there. And when I wake up, I'll start reaching for it and drinking it. And if we look at the brain, basically that first part is using this kind of frontal cortex, which is, has to do with kind of, it's like your CEO of 
you're starting to formulate a plan and put it together. But then once I start to get really automatic, I'm just going to be looking, my arm's going to be reaching. So something more in the, the middle of the kind of upper part here of the brain. And there'll be some brainstem activity where suddenly this motion will become automatic, just like driving a car, where we don't think about it anymore, that those habits of driving become automatic. So um, that's how I view habits. And I, I also like this analogy of a highway. If I have a habit that I like to uh, have some uh, tea and something sweet, you know, at 3.30, kind of like a tea time with my wife because she's from the Netherlands and they do that there. And I, we do that for about a year and then we decide, hey, we wanna um, not always eat sugary stuff during that time. We'd rather go for a walk. So we built that habit. It's like a highway in our brain. We've practice this habit, we've done it, it gives us a lot of joy, we talk to each other, we're eating something. Um, and now the, the new habit, walking together, we still get that joy of being together, we just don't eat something or drink something at that time. Maybe we'll have water or something instead. It's more like that little road on the right. So that new habits like the little road, the old habits like that main road, the highway. And the whole trick of habit change is to figure out this new habit and start to direct the traffic to the new road. So it becomes the highway and the old highway becomes small again and not much traffic is going through it. We have this incredible superpower, every single person on this call, every single person in the world, and it's called neuroplasticity. It's your ability to rewire your own brain. And people used to think that, oh, that's not gonna, you know, you get to a certain age, you can't do that anymore. That, that has nothing to do with reality. People are able to change and rewire their brains their whole lives. Um, it does help to have more resources. And of course, uh, in younger people, the, the brain sort of exploding with activity and then there's the pruning process. So there are moments when neuroplasticity can be at a much stronger level, but our whole lives, we have tons of neuroplasticity. So we're able to rewire our brain, which is really our gateway to the world, to reality. And so we're able to rewire it for better, for worse, in whichever way we reinforce our habits. And so just to kind of um, sum it up, when we have these experiences, it, it affects our neural pathways, and these are the things that create our habits. And so when we're doing agile transformations or dev, any kind of transformations, or we're trying to help teams be better teams uh, from that angle, or we're just trying to have make our lives better, um, it's it comes down a lot to the habits that we have. And so we wanna figure out how to holistically and effectively change those habits. It turns out it's pretty hard to change habits. It's not that easy. People used to think it took 21 days, but there's studies in London that show for me to get this habit of drinking water every morning, it could take me 20, 24 days. I think it took 22 days. If I wanna do 50 push-ups in the morning, that's gonna take me 84 days. On average, it takes 66 days to form even these smaller, simple habits. So if you're trying to change the habits of people who have been programming a certain way and interacting with people for 10, 20, 30 years and have been really rewarded for the work that they do, it's a tall order. It's not a small thing. And so you wanna be as effective and holistic as possible. These are the two books I mentioned. And we have a website, Total Brain Coaching. And so I'm moving through the material pretty quick, to be honest. And uh, you can always go to that website after and all this on there. And I'll put my um, email up uh, afterwards. And if you want copies of these, I'll send them either through ebook or uh, paperback. Um, but you have to send me your actual address if, uh, if you want the paperback, because that, that happens sometimes. So what are these seven principles of total brain coaching? Um, we have them as uh, the acronym of Dharmic. That's a, a word in India that means like along the path. Um, and basically these are seven principles and we have tools underneath each of these principles. And what we do is we form a protocol based on those tools. So it's a meta system of habit change. So you wanna, use different tools from each of these different principles. Um, we've actually created one main protocol that we've been using for the last year with teams and individuals and even organizations. 
And uh, we've stuck with that. We, we tweak it a little bit here and there, but other people have come up with other protocols and they're trying those too. So we'll go through each of these seven principles. First one is discover your energy state. And this is basically know yourself, uh, know your team, know your coach. Um, these are, you, you have to kind of have an awareness of who you are before you can kind of really start making a lot of changes. We use a tool um, called VPK Energy States. This is based on, uh, I worked for an Ayurvedic company. I sold, uh, or I ran an Ayurvedic company at one point. My father's done a ton of research on it. So we decided to create a, a tool. And if you go to totalbraincoaching.com in the middle of it, there's a little survey thing you can take. It doesn't cost anything. It just, um, it'll give you if you're predominantly V, predominantly P or predominantly K. And um, once you kind of know this about yourself or you know this about the teams or the people that you're working with or the pe people that you're coaching, you can help them with their habits uh, because there's no one process that works for everybody. It's just like agility. You, like, you have to customize everything and you have to know who you're working with and you have to know yourself, what things make sense to you and what things make sense to the person you coach. So these are the type of quiz that we would give sometimes. Uh, and we could do this, but it takes like 15 minutes. So I'll, I'll just allow you guys to go to that website if you're curious at all. But normally we'd go through this, we'd have everybody read these questions and kind of rate from one to five. You know, if they're a light sleeper and have difficulty falling asleep, if that's really true, they'd put a five. If it's not so true, they'd put a one. We'd answer all of these eight questions and then you kind of add up your score. So you know, for eight questions, maybe you get a 25 for V. We do the same thing for P, and then we do the same thing for K. And then you'd have these three different scores of your V score, your P score, and your K score. Whichever one's stronger, that's your predominant energy type. And these energy types, this kind of system is based not only on, on a system of medicine that's been around for thousands and thousands of years, there's also a lot of research that ties it back to genetic the genomes, genetic expression, and things like that. So um, we feel good about it. That's why we put it in the book. Other people use other assessments. We've used them too, Myers-Briggs, Colby. Um, there's hundreds of them. In terms of this type, um, when we know that you're a V energy type, this is like someone there's really creative kind of marketing types a lot of times. They're energetic. Um, when they're in balance, when they're out of balance, they can be easily distracted. Um, so we know that uh, for a V type to really maintain balance and be able to really focus and do new habits, they need to have a good routine and stay grounded. And a lot of times because of that creativity, you have to, as a coach, change it up a little bit so they can do something for two weeks. And then you have to change the experiment a little bit so that they feel like they're doing something new. The P types, these are sharp intellect, goal oriented, competitive, um, when in balance. But when they're not in balance, when they don't eat on time, that's one of the big things, they can get a little bit angry and aggressive when they're out of balance. So you got to make sure they eat on time. If my dad was here, I would point out that he's a P energy type, and our whole family is very focused on making sure he gets his lunch on time. Um, he's an unbelievable man. So I'm not saying that badly, but um, we do try to get him on time. Also, they don't, they can get overheated easily. And then your K energy types are when they're in balance, they're steady, supportive, and kind. But when they're out of balance, they can be very lethargic, stubborn, even depressed. And so you got to kind of get them off the couch. And I don't know, like for me, when I uh, hear these different types, I know different people that I've coached. Uh, that fall into, you know, some, and everybody has all these three things in them. It's just some things predominate and some things don't. The point is, is like, once you know who you're coaching with, you can get some help. And, and in total brain coaching, they have for V types, these strategies work for P types, these work for K types, these work. And also as a coach, you need to know yourself. If I'm a, a V type, I'm creative and I'm bouncing around and I'm coaching a p-type who wants things very regimented very process oriented that's going to be extremely frustrating for that p-type person they're going to be like what you know i just need something that i can follow and do really well and, and that's going to work for me 
Meanwhile, the V type is, well, let's try this and let's try this and let's try this. So knowing who you are, knowing who the person you're working with helps tremendously in um, getting people to change their habits. So this is kind of the main, one of the big pieces, the second principle, harnessing the neuroplasticity and gut brain axis. And we already talked about neuroplasticity and this idea of introducing a new habit. And then you have to kind of redirect the traffic so that that little road that we saw on the right becomes the main highway and the main highway, which is the old habit, becomes a little road. Um, and that's kind of what it says here. One of the best things that we found to kind of, because changing habits one by one takes a lot of time. It, it takes a lot of energy. And so sometimes we try to bring in what we call super habits. And learning is a, is in a great, becoming a, a lifelong learner, as they say, that's actually a great habit that can bring along a lot of other habits. Meditation, we find, you know, people find that meditation is a good habit. Love, gratitude, these type of things where you're practicing them, um, they can lead, they can pull a lot of other habits with them. So uh, they can kind of do a lot more. You can get a lot more mileage out of focusing on a super habit because as long as they're pulling in all the other habits that you want. So meditation's one of them. My dad does a ton of research on meditation. He's kind of, that, that was his whole career, uh, specifically transcendental meditation. Um, we're gonna focus on learning and learning agility as a super habit. Um, learning agility is kind of centers around the growth mindset. So I'm sure like all of you know, it's really good to, if we see new things as a challenge, or we have this fear of failure. So this is around a growth mindset. So uh, learning and adapting are accelerated when we have this learning mindset, when we get a new challenge, we, we take that challenge on as a positive thing. We increase our effort, we have higher achievement. If we fail, we don't feel like, oh, that's the end of the world. We basically go, okay, I learned something and I'm gonna try again. Um, there are a lot of organizations, there's a lot of institutions that have a different way of dealing with it. It's like, you gotta get it perfect. You gotta get it right the first time. Um, it can scare a lot of people until fear kicks in and they actually have to do stuff and they can avoid work until the last minute. And then they, they do the best they can. And um, a lot of times it's, um, they don't, they're afraid to actually talk um, honestly about what actually happened. Uh, and there's lots of companies where that happens. Enron's a great one at, at one point. I'm sure at, at, there are many people that had a learning mindset at Enron, but there's lots of examples of people that had this fixed mindset. So uh, learning agility is really focused on building that growth mindset. And you basically have these learning agility plays where you basically, you know, you have new experiences, you perform action. So we can go believing, seeing, risking, sense-making. That's Then you get to that experience part. Based on the experience, you perform action. You do this generative reflecting. You anchor that. You integrate that into the system. And then you start again. So this is kind of a way of building learning agility. This is kind of a fun slide, which basically talks about how learning agility is the capacity for rapid, continuous learning. And it may mean giving up what has worked in the past. And ways of building learning agility are experimenting with new approaches and behaviors, looking for connections across seemingly unrelated things, and uh, reflecting. And of course, Scrum builds, obviously, the retrospective is one of the, the great things that uh, Scrum gives to teams, gives to organizations, and this, a bit, this time to reflect and to kind of keep that component of continuous learning built in. So my dad and I, when we got into learning agility, we looked for the neurophysiological kind of correlate, what's, what's going on in the brain when you're building your learning agility. We found this principle called neuroadaptability. Neuroadaptability is how you respond when you're learning something new, like we talked about in the growth mindset. You respond to stress, so your body, the, you get these heart rate building, the, the brain, the, as you know, the, brain, the blood kind of comes in so that you can do stuff quickly. But when you have a high neuroadaptability, meaning you're in this more growth, growth mindset, you're then your, um, 
body relaxes quickly after that stimulus and you're able to use your full neural capacity. Because when you're in fight or flight, when you're operating under fear, you're not using your full capacity, your mental or intellectual or all your facilities, because your body's really focused on dealing with the problem there and it restricts blood flow to many different areas. So we're just finished publishing a paper on this neuroadaptability and different ways to measure it. We call it total brain coaching. This is a whole other part of it. It's also in the book. Um, there's been this huge sort of discovery recently about all the trillions of bacteria that are living in your gut, um, as pleasant or unpleasant as that sounds. But basically they have a huge amount of effect on the rest of your body and your brain. They have the ability to give off neurotransmitters. They have the ability to influence you, um, why you have cravings, why you do things. So actually taking care of your gut and your digestion is key in being able to learn habits quickly. So having that gut in balance, um, having the neuroplasticity available so that you can build new habits, these are kind of key components to building new habits. I won't go into all the details on this. The deeper part of this is that when you build a habit like drinking water, and let's say you do this for a year, at a certain point, you actually change your own DNA, you change your uh, genetics. So uh, epigenetic mechanisms, development, uh, environmental chemicals, drugs, pharmaceuticals, aging and diet. So you can build habits that affect your DNA. And that has a very profound effect because that's what, you know, you can help build habits in other people that will last for a long time. Once it gets into the DNA, it has a much greater chance of staying around. So now we're coming back to these seven principles of total brain coaching. And, uh, I just want to say, I, I appreciate, usually I take questions, but we'll do questions, I think, at the end. There'll be a chance for that, so I appreciate that. Um, and uh, we'll make it in this next 10, 15 minutes. So using the power of attention, um, that's the third principle. And basically, it, it's kind of Scrum, everyone who's in Scrum knows, you don't want to multitask when you're um, building a new habit. You want to be one-pointed. You don't want to be watching TV when you're trying to practice your habit of eating slowly or something. You want to be focused on that habit or whatever habit you're trying to build. Um, it also means breaking things down into small doable steps too. You don't want to try to take on too big of a habit change. You want to kind of break it down into the smaller pieces. Also, the fourth principle is finding your inner rhythm. So um, going to bed at a reason, you know, getting enough sleep, having proper diet, exercising. These are all ways to build your neuroplasticity. So that's one part of inner rhythm. The other is knowing your V type, whether you're P type or your K type, knowing um, what kind of rhythm when you're trying to change your habit. If you're a V type, it has to be a little bit more creative. If you're a P type, it can be very regimented. If you're a K type, you have to make sure there's somebody giving the energy to kind of get you going. Once you get going, you'll be in good shape. Um, so those are the type of things around inner rhythm. The fifth principle is the feedback matrix. And basically we have four different ways of building uh, new habits. And we, ooh, that's my screen going out. Can you still see it? Yep, four coaching oh, techniques. Excellent, awesome. Yes, yeah, okay. Good, good. So basically uh, you'll have so let's say we want to change uh, someone's habit around weight. We want them to stop snacking. Let's say that happened. we've done a number of those. And basically we may have them journal what they're eating. Uh, and that kind of is a self-reinforcement. We may have an app for them that we ask them to do. Usually they have a personal coach. So we have this personal coach also. Um, they may be involved in a group type of activity. And, and when you're working with teams, you, you can get that group reinforcement. And there may be environmental changes. Environmental changes are quite um, strong in this. So if I'm trying to stop snacking, I may not bring snack food into the house or I may have my wife hide it someplace, right? I'm not gonna be able to find it or get to it. So environment has a huge effect on habits. Um, and there's a lot of work on that. The sixth habit is uh, continuous improvement and integration. And obviously this is in the, 
the spirit of agility and making sure you, you measure things and you have clear goals and you integrate what the new thing that you're trying back into the old system, you allow it, uh, time for that. The last principle is uh, celebration. And this is one super important. Um, when you do a habit and you practice it and you succeed, do some type of celebration. If I have my habit for drinking water, I might just go, yes, you know? And that sounds silly, but what's happening when I'm doing that is a little bit of dopamine is being released in my brain and it's reinforcing, it's moving traffic from that highway to that little road and you're building the new habit. And celebration is often a step that um, a lot of people miss, especially um, in the scrum world. There's not really this really joyous kind of celebration when we you know, have that first sprint where we get everything done. Um, maybe, maybe it happens, but it has to be reinforced time and time again. And it's really good to reinforce even the small wins, even when any item goes to that done. Um, I know I do uh, dojo coaching. So I have a team for about six weeks. And every time we move something to done when we're trying to get them to reduce their whip limits and all that kind of stuff, um, we hit a, dong, a gong or something. So we try to reinforce that with a, some type of celebration as much as possible. That will help you build that habit as fast as possible. So again, these last couple principles, using that feedback matrix, having them self-coach, using a personal coach, getting the group involved, changing the environment to reinforce the habit that you want, and making sure you celebrate after every little piece um, that will help speed up that um, the habit change process. So there's also uh, some uh, research done at Harvard around the progress principle, talking about how it's it's important. You know, you can use um, negative feedback or positive feedback. You can use uh, you know pat on the back or whatever they however they say that thing, but. What happens is over time, when you use fear, and this happens in a lot of organizations, when fear is the main factor, um, the progress starts to, you can get some response in the beginning, but then people get into that work avoidance mode. They don't wanna be in that department. They wanna stay away because when you're operating in fear, your brain's not using its full potential. And it's very difficult to get in flow. A lot of times I, that's one of the main things I do with teams is try to help them get into flow so that they're, you know, my goal when I work with a, a group is I want you to have more energy at the end of the day than when you started. And everyone goes, yeah, yeah, that's not going to happen. But at least working towards that, we, we talk about how could that happen? And then we start to break things down. And this progress principle using kind of positive feedback works out a lot better. So we, my dad and I, we wrote these two books last year, and there's just been a lot of great work. We've got to work with a lot of other coaches, including Sherman, and uh, we have a whole kind of coaching group. And uh, we've got to work with some top coaches, uh, Pat Reed, who's in the California area, and different coaches around. So we've gotten a lot of materials, and we've been working on another set of books. And this second, this third one is... Trouble in Paradise. This is kind of a fun book, um, how to deal with people who push your hot buttons using total brain coaching. So we have these two, we have these characters in our book in the story, you know, the business fables called the Smiths. And so we have this whole saga. We have about three or four books that have these characters and how they grow and how they use total brain coaching and different other things. Um, so that book's about that. We're just putting out our fourth book, I think in a month or two called, um, and that's a fourth book for me working with my dad. My dad has a lot of books out. Um, that's called Self Empower. That's, that has that neuroadaptability and it has um, a couple other things. It has what we call the value change framework. So this is a framework that we use when working with teams, when we're trying to um, help people you know, with their habits. This is a little bit more of life coaching stuff, but I also apply it to teams and organization. So whenever you start out, you have a vision, you have the awareness of where they are, where they wanna go. You have, a, it's kind of a visual way where you have all the learnings that they're working on. Um, you have a separate principle to take the new learnings that you do and make sure they're integrated, they're unified with the system that you're building or that the system that, that's trying to do these new experiments. 
And then of course, experimenting. So we use that value change framework in a lot of different situations. Um, we also have something based upon uh, how the brain um, adopts new things. Uh, it's through networks. So like at the company I'm working with now, they're trying to do a cloud transformation, AWS transformation. So we build a visual board with all the different people who are really passionate about that change. And we make sure they're you know, connected through Slack or through uh, communities of practice. But it's nice to have a visual board. So when anyone new comes in, they know all through the organization who are the people that are really into championing this change. And we also have a shared space. So when anyone gets a win, they share it. So everybody can kind of um, appreciate that. One of the last tools is called the vector framework. And this is for OKRs, objectives, and key results. I think that's key, key something. I, I, I think I'm getting that right or wrong. That's always confusing to me. Um, we're using it at the company I'm at. I've used it before. But when you have multiple uh, departments, multiple um, teams working on the same objective, I like to have tools that give the whole picture. So the vertical lines in this are time. So like say quarters. And it's nice to see all the different, everyone who's working on the same objective in the organization we can see all the different vectors and how much progress they're making through the vector system. So it gives you a more holistic picture of, of moving these OKRs in an organization. And that is pretty much uh, it. Uh, it's again, I, I, if anyone's more interested in this, they can go to the website, um, totalbraincoaching.com and I will escape out of this. I'll put my email in the, um, in the chat, or if somebody can put my email in the chat, I'll, I'll have to jump out and come back my main screen, even though you can see me somehow, uh, if I click the button to wake it up again, it'll, it'll pop me out. So uh, you could put Ted talk today at gmail.com. And if anyone wants copies of the books, either e or uh, physical, I'd be happy to send them. I, I just need got to make sure you send your uh, address if, if you want to softback copy or hardback copy. I think we only have softback copy, so uh, I don't think we could do hardback. And really appreciate everyone's time. Are there any questions? Or, or Sherman, I, I want to turn it back to you. I know you have a format that you do, and I, I want to make sure I, I stay within that. And awesome. so thanks, Ted. Thanks, Ted. Uh, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Appreciate that. And let me share my, let me get these things out of the way. Oh, cool. Those are awesome. I, I may use your pictures that you have here. <laughs> Very cool. Those are awesome. Let me make sure, yeah, I got the right screen up. Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure I get the right screen. Sometimes it doesn't pop up, right? Yeah, so thanks to Kelly for putting this together. So what we're going to do now, guys, is we're going to break you into teams, groups, and you're going to do kind of a uh, little uh, answer question and answer, a little treasure hunt. So we have seven breakout rooms that uh, align with the seven, um, seven aspects of total brain coaching, uh, your energy state, neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity, power of attention, your inner rhythm, the feedback matrix, continuous improvement, and celebrating steps of success. So each one of these breakout rooms, when I send you to it, you'll work with your team and you have eight questions to answer. Answer those questions. When you guys are done, come back to the breakout, come back to the main room and we'll do that first. And then we'll go ahead and we'll kind of do Q and A. Uh, and then we can kind of do other breakout topics that you want to talk about within this. So we'll do that fun activity first, then we'll come back for QA. Good with that, Ted? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys the link here because that's the first thing you're going to need. So let me put that here in chat so everybody can come join the board, the Trello board. Okay. Just put that in track and chat. Please join the Trello board. I'm also gonna stop recording at this time. So you guys know that I have that.